No Choff Des Podcast. There you go. No Choff Des Podcast. I'm your host, Sel. I've got a club legend joining me on this episode. Uh, do you know what? I shouldn't really be introducing him because here he is, Noel Kaseke. How you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm good, thank you. How's everything? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Like I say, it's, it's an absolute privilege to have you on this podcast. And, you know, as I was telling you before we started recording, we've had so many people messaging me saying, can you ask him this? Can you ask him that? Um, <laughs> b- b- before we talk about your time at Omonia, um, I know you were born in, in Zimbabwe, Bulawayo, uh, 24th of December, 1980. So your birthday is coming up very, very soon. You looking forward yeah. to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's a milestone for me until now. Grateful to be alive, but we take it a day at a time as it comes. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah. again, before we talk about your time at Almonia, a uh, little bit of a serious question here. What was it like growing up in, in an era under, under Mugabe in, in Zimbabwe? Because we've heard a lot of negative things about him. Was there, was there feeling mutual out there? Look, uh, growing up during that time in the 80s, you know, uh, Zimbabwe was a different place, believe me. Uh, the situation was good. Uh, had my education, uh, wrote my Cambridge exam. We had a lot of academies, uh, British coaches coming to Zim, uh, helping uh, out in the academies, coaches coming from Switzerland, all over Europe, you know. It was, uh, I have fond memories of my childhood, you know, and growing up, it was good, believe me. Brilliant. Unfortunately, years went by, things were a little bit different, you know, but uh, even though things got a little bit difficult, I'm still proud to be Zimbabwe. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, man. That's a fantastic yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic thing. Um, talk to me about your heroes when you were growing up, uh, your footballing heroes, because I remember growing up watching the likes of Peter Unlove and, and Bruce Grobler. Would you say that they were Zimbabwean heroes? Yeah, look, uh, during that time, uh, Peter Nav and uh, Chris Gobla, like, they were the mainstay, you know, of our national team back then. And we had a uh, German coach, Renat Fabisch, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, he passed on. Uh, may he so rest in peace. Uh, he was a good coach. We really had a good team also with our national under 23. We really had uh, good things going on for us. Fantastic. So you're at Highlanders, you started at right back, you were there for three seasons, and then you ended up in Cyprus, and then your little adventure yeah. at Omonia. Um, wow, 155 appearances, five goals, you won the league title, two cups. Wow. Um, you know, we had Leandro on the show, and uh, again, a lot of people were, were asking questions and whatnot, but in terms of your time at Omonia, what would you say were your fondest memories? I mean, in fact, before you answer that, why Omonia? Look, uh, when I started in junior level, my natural position was defensive midfield, you know. Mm. But uh, going into Highlanders uh, first team, you know, with the British coaches that we had during our time and also the... Oh, don't say that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. So... Uh, you had to be versatile. You had to learn to play different positions, you know. And by that time, we had a lot of talented uh, players already playing in the team. So it was really something that helped me to some extent to learn, you know, to adjust in any situation to play in any position. Okay. Uh, Coming to that, when I came to to Cyprus, okay, it was a really good uh, experience for me. But why Ammonia? Look, uh, when I got to Cyprus and uh, I was with Paralimni, uh, we played a friendly game with uh, Ammonia. I think the game finished 1-0 uh, for Ammonia. They won against us in Paralimni. Uh, I had a good experience, you know, like, okay, it was a friendly game. A lot of fans came through. And also, coming from Highlanders, one of the biggest clubs in Zimbabwe, with very passionate fans, you know, filling up the stadium, 20, 25, 15,000 people. When you are on the streets after losing a game, the pressure, you know, I, I got used to it, you know, from at that uh, young age, even coming from Zimbabwe, you know. So also the appreciation from the fans, because Highlanders, whether it was a friendly game, 
cup game from the day one they expected you to win the games you know so it was just in my veins you know to to play in a big club so during the years i was in paralimni we played against apoel anorthosis iel you know but there was just something special with the ammonia fans you know like uh, ammonia wasn't achieving what they were supposed to be achieving but could you you could feel the buzz you know you could feel what they wanted from the team even the team was struggling you know and it had a little bit of that feeling from my club you know like family we are in a bad time but we are there we will not stop uh, being part of ammonia because the team is struggling you know so uh, it appealed to my dna from where i was coming from so it wasn't that of a difficult choice for me Mm, brilliant. Well, look, I was talking to Matt Derbyshire a few weeks ago and you know, I seem to remember an interview he gave uh, Omonia TV and he said that the one word he, that encapsulates Omonia for him is family and you've used that same word and given the amount of people that have messaged me uh, to ask you questions, you're obviously part of that family. You know, a lot of people still see you as part of the Omonia family and I think that's a credit to you in terms of the, the commitment that you've given the football club. You know, as you said, there were some bad times but there were some good times and yet you were still giving a hundred percent, if not more. Yeah, that's true. Uh, like I said, you know, I was made to feel welcome, you know, even mm. before I came to Amonia because uh, look, my childhood, you know, back in Zimbabwe, family comes first, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, growing through the Highlanders Academy, going through to the first team, family was the most important in good and bad times, you know? So, uh, it was just a hand in glove moment, you know, when Amonia came to me and they said, okay, we would like you to join us. And I, it was an honor for me. So it wasn't difficult for me to fit in that kind of a setup, you know. Mm. So also uh, credit also to Paralim, they have the same DNA, you know. They are a small club, but to them, Paralim is home, you know. It's home. Yeah. Then, okay, they don't have so much fans, but Ammonia, the fan base, okay, they express their disappointment, but they never leave you. They're right there. Yeah. You know, so it was easy for us, you know. 100%, 100%. Okay, well, let's talk about season 09-10. -09 well, um, oh, bloody hell, we had an unbeaten run that lasted, what, three and a half months, but we lost only two games in that season, it was, it was in, incredible. It was absolutely incredible season. Uh, I seem to remember the the title celebrations, especially seeing on the television uh, in the dressing room. Everyone was going absolutely crazy. And you know, Dougie's Lemonese did a fantastic job at the club. But in terms of your fondest memories that season, it's got to be that unorthodox goal, right? Look, uh, at the end of it all, okay, that unorthodox goal was was really special because it came at a crucial moment. You know, we we needed to get back in the game. And we had not started well, I remember that game. But you know, uh, the fondest memory that I have is when we won against Apoel back to back, you know? That made a really, really big statement like, okay, uh, we're going all the way, you know? After that moment where we, lo we lost to win the league against uh, Apollo, when Apollo Nicola uh, scored in the last moment of the mm. game to make 1-1, those crucial moments, those goals, you know, like the game against Apoel, the back-to-back, -back, besides them being our rivals, you know, that really stayed with me. Like, okay, we shot, okay, all through the season, but that moment matters the most, you know. It was just so important coming from the end of the games and then the playoffs, you know. It was just so crucial, you know, that moment and uh, it still sticks to my memory, you know. For me, that moment we won the league. Mm, absolutely even absolutely. though the games went through but that moment we won the league for us you know mm. yeah. tell, tell me something in terms of your position you know uh, defensive midfielder winning the ball uh distributing it to you know your wingers your your front men what was the physicality like in the Cypriot league at that time because i look at the standard of football out there now and it, it has improved don't get me wrong i think defensively it's it's still the same but in terms of a midfield general, you know, we've seen so many fantastic players throughout the world. If you want to talk about Makalele, if you want to talk about N'Golo Kante, you want to talk about other players in, in that role. But, you know, you were practically the midfield general there. So what was it like for you in terms of the quality and the physicality? Look, uh, honestly, during that time in the Cypriot League, in my opinion, 
it was very very difficult because uh, you had uh, players from anorthosis like Savio who were there at that time uh, in Apuel you had uh, Chris Michael and such as during their best time you know it was not easy it was not easy and when you talk about ammonia imagine you had to fight uh, in training to ascertain a place where you had players like uh, Leandro, you had, um, he came from, uh, from Greece, uh, even though he, he didn't really reach his full potential, uh, I forget his well, name. Yeah, uh, yeah, Aguilar as well, didn't you, the Portuguese fella, you had him there as well. Yeah, we had also uh, Aguilar, Bruno Aguilar, you yeah. know, so... You had also Scopelidis in uh, Anorthosis. It was not easy, you know, and uh, you knew you had to perform week in, week out, you know. But, you know, uh, we had a good bond. Mm. It didn't really matter who was playing, but on your own, you knew you had to push yourself to the next level, you know. And with, uh, with Lemonis, his assistant, we had uh, Alejandro, also the fitness coach, uh, it, 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 everything was just working well, you know, yeah. but the work, you know, didn't really start during that time. That work started the year before with, uh, uh, with the previous coach, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Tutich. When we, when we had a good run in the, uh, in the UEFA games, you know, against Ajax, you know, everything started to come through during that moment. And then Lemonis just came and put the glue together, you know, and stacked everything up, you know, the process was just beginning before with Tutich and Lemonis just knew how to just gel and bring everything together, you know. Was it the so man it, management more than anything that you say was different? Look, uh, Lemonis is a big coach. You know, yeah. he was coming from Olympiacos. He, he had that charisma. He knew how to handle everyone, you know. So it didn't matter. He brought big names like we are coming from the big club. Yeah. Uh, I think Basta Zoglu uh, turned up as well, didn't he? Yeah, we, we had also parts are coming in, you know. We had a lot of big players, you know. Then we had Timo Wenzel, the, the yeah. big general at the back coming in, you know. Look, Beast. <laughs> we, had really, we had really big names, you know. But Lemonis, he knew how to bring everybody together, yeah. you know. And it didn't matter. We had also... Uh, yeah, well, there was a lot of youngsters guy. as well, wasn't there? There's a lot of youngsters. I think Christophe was there at the point at that time, wasn't yes. he? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it was a it was a very balanced squad. As well. I mean, there, there was a lot of non Cypriots, which is what you'd expect from yeah. from Cypriot clubs at that point. But you know, when you when you look at the likes of you know, um, uh, as you mentioned, Basad Soglu was there. We had Aguiar with uh, Magridis, Banayi, lots of Greek Cypriot players. So the the, the blend was there. Yeah. It was not easy, you know. Honestly, it was, in my opinion, was a really strong squad. We had also Costandino in front. We, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just, it was not easy. We had uh, Statis and Oneftis in one of his best moments. We had uh, also Davidson. Uh, we had also Elias Karalambos. Uh, uh, also with the goalkeeping, uh, we had, it, it was a really good squad, you know. Yep. You, you couldn't spend a day off in training. You couldn't. Because you spend a day off, you'll be out. Well, th- this is it. They say that your first opponent is your teammate because they're the one that's challenging for your, for your position. So yeah. it, it, it must have been very, very difficult. As you mentioned, very competitive. But yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a fantastic season. We won't talk about that European game where a certain Romanian referee cheated us out of that. But um, we'll, we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> we'll talk about yeah. that another day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, look, um, I'm going to give you some quick fire questions because I know that you've got a, a very busy schedule. And again, I really appreciate your time. Got a lot of yeah. questions from from uh, supporters. I've got Artemis asking, what was your favourite match at Omonia? The favourite match at Omonia was in Athens. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And the, the fans were amazing, just from warming up. They just gave us the vibe that, okay, you can win this European match, okay? You're playing with Ajax, they have Rivaldo, they have Skoko. It doesn't matter. We are Monia, we're right there. We'll be in your face. We will take it, you know? Brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I've asked the question already. The most popular one is always your favourite moment at Omonia, but we've done that one already. I had to yeah. ask that one first, you know, because that was, that was very, very important. Um, Neil Fielders asked, um, which team did you enjoy beating most? 
<laughs> a poet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, yeah, yeah, the, the, the derby, you know, like uh, we, we had to claim the rights of Nicosia to show them, you know, who is boss, you know, who owns uh, Nicosia, who is the best in Cyprus. Look, it, 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 it had a different feeling altogether, you know, the build up to it, uh, not only a week before, you know, you knew like next week we're playing up, up well. The vibe was different going to that last game before you got to play up well, you know? Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. George asks, what was the best, or who was the best player you played with and against? I think the first part is a bit unfair because you can't say the best teammate you ever had, but what about the best player you played against? Oh, look, uh, Rivaldo. Mm. Rivaldo, yeah. <laughs> Rivaldo showed us above the rest with uh, Robinho in those two uh, European nights. But uh, locally, like in the Cypriot League, I would say Savio. Savio. Yeah. I would say Brilliant. Savio, uh, in my opinion, in my time with, uh, in Ammonia. And uh, while I was in Paralimni, uh, Kaspaya, my friend, was Kaspar. impossible. Yeah. yeah, he was impossible. Yeah, he, he's yeah. a he, he's a very aggressive footballer, as I remember, especially at his mm-hmm. time in in England. Um, but yeah, he's he's kind of transferred those aggressive skills to his management style. <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, like look, it's his in the, it's his DNA. You know, powerful, strong, great technique. He could shoot. He could cut inside. I'm busy trying to control the midfield. Then I need to worry about Kispai coming on my inside. You know. Hmm. And when he does, his physicality was just amazing. So what about Almonia then when, during your time at the club? Was there a, play, a particular player whose technique stood uh, stood above everyone else's, so to speak? Because I've spoken to people who have played for other teams and they said to me, you know, one of them, my, my friend Leon Knight was at Chelsea uh, as a youngster and he was telling me Gianfranco Zola was just, you know, elite. He, you know, he played with Casiraghi, with Viali, with Desai. He, so he grew up playing with those players as a youngster. Yeah. But when Zola was there, there was no, the, the level was up here. There was, the bar was fully raised. What about you when you were at Monday? Was there any player that you looked at and you thought, wow, like he's, he's a different level? Look, uh, honestly speaking, Leon. Leo, Leo was special. I don't know in the eyes of many, you know, but uh, he had a special left foot, you know. Mm-hmm. Look, One. There, were some, <laughs> there were some things, you know, like in training, that he made look simple. And each time I played with him, you know, I enjoyed playing with him and being against him in training was a nightmare because he, he's so special, my friend. He, yeah. in my opinion, the things that he would do, like he knew where to find the right spaces. You would think Alejandro is just like a normal uh, number six, but no, he knew where to find the right spaces in training, you know, to find that extra second to to find the next forward pass some players i could predict you know and say okay if i do close your space here you play back pass then i'm okay Mm. but with leandro you have to constantly look the next space to close and then he's found the next space so he's two steps ahead of everyone practically yeah yeah you know he could read the space you know He, he he was so intelligent he was so intelligent but you being a coach at the moment in Dubai, it, it, is that mostly a coaching thing? Or do you think a lot of that is like, a, like an ability, like a gift, something that you're born with? Because not every footballer has that kind of extra dimension to their game. I, I, be, I believe you can coach it into people, but I think it's also part of your natural ability as well. Would you agree with that? Yeah, look, uh, like now, uh, fortunately, with the technology now, uh, I'm doing a master's, you know, in performance and tactical uh, work, you know, from uh, MBP, uh, a Spanish academy, you know. There is one thing I'm learning. You can teach that. But most of the players like David Silva, I give you an example. It's, it's, their, natural, it's their natural instinct. Yeah. Football now, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's all about spaces, you know. Like, uh, I guess it was inside me, you know, like I could read the game without being taught. And then Lemonis gave me something extra. So sometimes I knew where to be without running so much. Mm. And then without running so much, it looked like I could cover a lot of ground. Why? I had a lot of extra energy to cover the right back, the left back, because those key moments, 
I knew where to be and cut off the fire, win the ball, give it to the next guy. Yeah. So when I needed to cover my right back, my center back, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem for me because I had that in the extra tank. I wasn't wasting energy, mm. you know? And then now being a coach, some of those things, you have players that have it inside that you don't teach them. And Leandro was just natural. Mm. But it's something that you can teach. You can help a player to improve on that, to find the spaces. Because if you teach a player to find those small spaces, they have one extra step. Like now what I'm, what I'm learning, you know, as a coach, like if we are going to play the next game, I see the spaces of the other team. And then I can come to you in the week before, tell you, look, my friend, for us to be more effective offensively, I need you to find those spaces because they leave those spaces for you. So I can teach you. I can adjust something in your game to make it be more effective, you know? So a lot of things are changing in football, but you can probably teach it. No, I'm, I'm glad you said that, mate, because um, the past couple of weeks I've, I've been banging on about this on my social media that Omoni at this moment in time, we've got a fantastic youth academy. We've got some incredible young talents breaking through like Johnny's, Loizu, uh, Gagulis, uh, Haralambus, uh, Banayodu, Venezuela, all these players, they're all breaking through and they've got so much potential ability. But yeah. I think because we've also got a lot of older heads in the squad, like your Hubert Chans, uh, Jordi Gomez, um, you know, Eric Botiak, all these other footballers that these youngsters can learn from. But my major concern is I don't know if these youngsters are asking the questions to these to these older players. Now, I'm not in the in the training camp, so I don't see these things. But yeah. I'm just thinking that they've got to make the most of these older heads in the squad because they're going to retire sometime soon. And by that time, it might be too late for these youngsters to ask questions in training. Education is key when it comes to youth development, isn't it? Yeah. Look, uh, for example, you mentioned the guy who's wearing my favorite number, 16. I, 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 I have followed him a few times when I watched the clips, you know. That player is so intelligent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he sees what the others are not seeing and then he plays a pass and the others are not in the same, in the same length with him. And yep. either the player is late one second or he has gone too early. You know, so it happens. Look, uh, probably they could ask him, you know, but being a player like, for example, David Silva, I give an example, and also Jordi Gomez, he would probably give him tips like, look, if you want to find the next step, you can do this, you can do this. Mm -hmm. But I believe, I don't know how Ammonia are working, and I believe they are working well because you, you do see the progress of the young players coming from the reserve team to the first team. You see there's a lot of progress and we need to continue that. That's the only way Ammonia can continue growing, you know, probably sell players outside to bigger leagues. But like you said, they need to make use of Yodi Gomez. Talk to him, you know, learn something from him. But the best way that I can learn, believe me, that how I was learning, when I had the chance after the game, I would get our next, our, our previous game. I would watch it at home. What is it that I, I did well? What is it that I can do better? What is it that I can improve, you know? And then learn, for example, from Jordi Gomez, like, okay, why is it that in a game probably he loses the ball only once? How does he receive the ball, you know? And Body then shape, uh, positioning. Yeah, work. exactly. So that's where also, you know, uh, the coaches come in. Uh, the analysts part come in. Uh, the, the tactical yep. coaches come in. That's where they come in. Get the young, young men, look. In the last game or in the last four or five games, you are missing. You, you should be on 10 goals by now. Why? Yep. Because you, you're supposed to be here. You're supposed to reach this moment earlier. You're supposed to reach, okay, late. What do you have to improve? Yep. Help him, show him, and then create some training drills. You know, we bring him in at the end of the training. Sheet, extra 10 minutes every day to help him, you know. Then the next time he knows, okay, I can be there in the next moment. I can be there later. They will improve, you know. Yeah. It's, but that's it's if they want to. That's if they want to. That's the thing. You know, yeah. a player has to yeah. want it. They have to put in the effort. They have to put in the, you know, the, the, the as I said, the effort and because it's so physically but demanding. You know, but you know what's the difference now? The, the players now, they are growing in a different time than my time. I did it by myself without asking the coach. Mm. that's my generation you know so with this generation you have to get in their face but get in their face in a good way you might get in their face and you lose them yeah 
So you, you've got to learn the, the push and pull because they are a different lot. They have social media, uh, one, one good game, and he's all over social media. Ah, he knows football. So you, you, you've got to learn how to, to deal with them, push and pull, uh, push and hug, you know. Yeah. And in that way, you have to learn, okay, look, I'm calling you not because you're doing bad, okay? This is it. Show him, look, you're doing fantastic. But what you're doing, I believe you can make it one more step. You can even make it more perfect. You're doing it at 60%. I want you to do it at 80%. When you do it at 80%, you improve the productivity of my team. You make us one more step, you know. So it's a man management and also learning to help him tactically and as an individual to improve and get better. And when you teach him and he feels it, it's helping him. In the end, he will start coming to you. Ah, coach, that video, how did I do last week? He will call you. He will do it by himself. So it's a little bit tricky, but it, it's possible. It can be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. no, I've got, I've got one more question here for you, mate. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've seen the club's league form. It hasn't been great recently. We haven't scored in three games, a couple of draws, one defeat. But for me, that... It's no surprise given that it's coincided with Europa League football. Now, I've always argued with many fans that when you play Europa League football or Champions League football and then going into Cypriot football, the levels are completely different. So effectively, you're gonna, there's going to be more intensity in the Europa League games. There's going to be more concentration required. It's going to eat up a lot of your mental and physical energy, right? But when you go to the league games, it's completely different because you've got teams that are set up differently. So whereas in the Europa League, you might be doing a lot of pressing, but you're sitting behind the ball. But in the league, you're doing a lot of pressing, but also doing a lot of attacking where teams are set up differently. So it's consuming both mentally and physical. Now, again, me, I'm not a pro footballer. I've never seen, I've never been on a, on a football pitch with, you know, pros, but I can see it myself. I see from, from a coaching standpoint, from a mental and physical standpoint. So would you agree that, Perhaps fans are getting on the, the players' backs a little bit too much because the levels are going from one game on a Thursday to another game on a Sunday, completely different. Look, uh, in my opinion, playing those European games that they're playing now in the group stage, it's raising their profiles like as a player. Mm. Because he, they, for example, spend okay, like you're saying, they are defending, then they try to play in a country. They're playing differently in... European games because of the quality that they are facing, you know, and then they play differently in the league. But there is, for example, like you said, their football intelligence, if I may put it, is improving. They are learning, for example, to defend better. They are learning to play better in transitions. They are learning to play better in transitions offensively, defensively. They are learning a lot of things. And then the time frame between the European game and the league game, the recovery, you know, in between the one extra day, you know, also, like you said, mentally and physically, they are drained. But the recovery time sometimes uh, also drained. That's where, for example, the squad comes in, you know. And the coach, I'm sure he's doing his best to try and rotate, but at the same time, not lose the momentum of the, of the league to stay a little bit far from the, from the rest of the team, from the chess and pack, or create a, a big gap between those that are in front, you know. But at the same time, I understand the frustrations of the, of the fans. Uh, the fan always, he wants to win, you know. The fans always want to win. And at of the same course. time, we, we cannot uh, afford to go in Europe and just go and just make a performance and say, okay, yeah. we're going to focus. We have to make even... We win, we lose, we must make a statement. Yeah. That, okay, we are here because we deserve to be here. And they deserve to be there. So, on the other hand, uh, looking at it, look, uh, we have to take it. This is ammonia, you know, like, they will, the fans will push them. Mm. But uh, one thing that I know about the ammonia fans, they mean well. So, the players at the same time, you, 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 this is one something new for them. Yeah. They have to take it. They will grow from it. And eventually, they will get better as the season progresses. When they start to have one more day of recovery, yep. you know, to get better, it will be okay. It, everything's going to be fine. Of course, I agree. Yeah. I, think, I think the concern, there's two concerns really, is that Anastasia, 
seven points ahead of us, but they're only playing one game a week and teams are set up differently against them. And exactly. Like you said, no, playing one game a week. Look, I, I have the whole week to work on everything. Mm. I have to improve. I have to change. But you've got to understand that the coach has to work, for example, two, three days to prepare for the next game again as the, a European game with the technical quality different that he, he has to push the players to a certain limit in a different way. Then probably he's got a day to work for the next game so uh, it's different they have a lot of time you know he, uh, to prepare for the next game and other season but i saw a few highlights from the last game like look what i can only comment from the few highlights that i saw i haven't seen the whole games even though we are not winning i think now we are we're just not being a little bit we're not being effective in front of goal because like i saw the game of uh well, dogs yeah dogs uh we could have been ahead three, four goals in front before then. Even though when the score was two all, we, we could have still scored more goals, you know. But it does happen. But eventually when the team starts to be a little bit more fresh, when they have probably a week, they, they will score. They will yeah. come back. Yeah. The good is that the team is staying there, my friend. The team is staying there. Well, this is it. I mean, look, we, we lost um, we lost Matt Derbyshire in the summer, who scored 12, 13 goals last season. Uh, you know, Duris has come in and he missed a great opportunity against Docks and he's been absolutely slammed by fans left, right and centre. I feel sorry for him because I see what he does off the ball. You know, he, he presses, he chases defenders down. He's physical. There was a goal that we scored against uh, IL, or IX, sorry, where he's challenged the goalkeeper in the end. Had he not made that challenge on the goalkeeper, he wouldn't have pushed it straight to Johnny's to have scored. And people don't see that, you know? And I feel sorry for the guy because there are, there are big boots to fill, you know? I mean, when you were there, I mean, you had uh, Aloneftis, we had Costandino, we had, who else did we have? Uh, we had a lot of strikers in that squad, but the goals yeah. were, were shared throughout the pitch. And I think that, the problem that we have at the moment is that we're not getting goals from all over the pitch. And like, all right, Botiak has scored a few, Jordi scored a couple here and there, but they're not being shared all over the pitch. But as you said, it will come. It's it's a process and we need to trust that process. Yeah, look, I, I feel sorry for him too, like you're saying. But at the same time, look, uh, unfortunately, from my point of view, like as a coach, you know, when you're looking at it from the other side, like, for example, we, I'll give an example about uh, Bobby Firmino. Mm. Klopp lo loves him. He doesn't score, but there, e there is a reason why he's in the team. So probably that guy, he's not scoring now, and the coach loves him. There is a reason that I don't know because I, I don't watch and I don't know how the coach plays and how they are set up. So the, the, co the, the fans have to understand, but also the player has to also understand his role in the club and his role in the team. And at the same time, the fans think like this. He's a striker. He must score. Yeah. So yeah. He, he, both sides are okay. You know, we, we have to accommodate it. And uh, it, it, it's fine. We have to take it from the fans. We, uh, we have to be strong. We have thick skin. Eventually, things, like you said, the process, it will come through. In the end, the people will understand, you know. Like Absolutely. now, the people understand, ah, uh, when Bobby Firmino is out of the team, like in the last game with City, when he went, when Klopp put him out, they lost something. They couldn't create so many chances. Uh, they were coming out stuck. But when he was there in the first half, every time when the transitions were coming in, you find Salah behind, you find Mane behind. They would find the chances easier because of Bobby Firmino. Yeah. When Bobby Firmino is out, the, the dimensions change, oh, yeah. and the setup Liverpool change. They stopped creating those chances. So, I'm looking at it that way because uh, I'm now a coach, so I understand. But we have to keep going. Absolutely. We have yeah. to keep going. Yeah. I agree, mate. I agree. Well, no, look, it's been an absolute honour having you on, on the podcast, mate. And I just want to end it with this. We had a message from uh, Roy, and he's a big fan of yours. And he said, the passion, the commitment, the love he showed for the club will never be forgotten. One of my favourite players. I still have his jersey signed, which I got for my birthday. I even named one of my fish after him. See? <laughs> 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 so you know as yeah, I said, yeah. you're a club legend and every message I've got has been absolutely positive and I, again thank you ever so much for being such a great player for the club really appreciate it all thank you thank you so much and uh, it's an honour and a pleasure to still be part of Ammonia and uh, hopefully uh, God willing you never know how uh, destiny has it 
I might find my way back home. I might not, whatever Touch happens. Wood. Yeah, whatever happens, I am grateful. I'm thankful. I hope uh, when uh, COVID passes, I can pay a visit with my family because that's my second home. And uh, hopefully I can pass by and say hello. Brilliant. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I wish uh, Ammonia all the best. And we really always keep in touch with my family. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Noel Kosake. Thank you very much, Noel. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Thank you Cheers. so much. Thank you.